Part six of The Naval War of 1812 by Theodore Roosevelt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part six. On the other hand, the American crew, even according to James, were as fine a set of men as ever were seen on shipboard. Though not one fourth were British by birth, yet many of them had served on board British ships of war, in some cases voluntarily, but much more often because they were impressed. They had been trained at the guns with the greatest of care by Lieutenant Allen, and finally Commodore Decatur handled his ship with absolute faultlessness. To sum up, a brave and skilful crew, ably commanded, was matched against an equally brave but unskilful one, with an incompetent leader and this accounts for the disparity of loss being so much greater than the disparity in force at the outset of this battle the position of the parties was just the reverse of that in the case of the constitution and guerriere the englishman had the advantage of the wind but he used it in a very different manner from that in which captain hull had done the latter at once ran down to close but manoeuvred so cautiously that no damage could be done him till he was within pistol shot captain cardin did not try to close till after fatal indecision and then made the attempt so heedlessly that he was cut to pieces before he got to close quarters commodore decatur also manoeuvred more skilfully than captain dacre although the difference was less marked between these two the combat was a plain cannonade the states derived no advantage from the superior number of her men for they were not needed the marines in particular had nothing whatever to do while they had been of the greatest service against the guerriere the advantage was simply in metal as ten is to seven lord howard douglas's criticisms on these actions seem to me only applicable in part he says page five hundred twenty four the americans would neither approach nor permit us to join in close battle until they had gained some extraordinary advantage from the superior faculties of their long guns in distant cannonade and from the intrepid uncircumspect and often very exposed approach of assailants who had long been accustomed to contemn all manoeuvring our vessels were crippled in distant cannonade from encountering rashly the serious disadvantage of making direct attacks the uncircumspect gallantry of our commanders led our ships unguardedly into the snares which wary caution had spread these criticisms are very just as regards the macedonian and i fully agree with them possibly reserving the right to doubt captain cardin's gallantry though readily admitting his uncircumspection but the case of the guerriere differed widely there the american ship made the attack while the british at first avoided close combat and so far from trying to cripple her adversary by a distant cannonade the constitution hardly fired a dozen times until within pistol shot this last point is worth mentioning because in a work on heavy ordnance by captain t f simmons r a london eighteen thirty seven it is stated that the guerriere received her injuries before the closing mentioning especially the thirty shot below the water line whereas by the official accounts of both commanders the reverse was the case captain hull in his letter and lieutenant morris in his autobiography say they only fired a few guns before closing and captain dacre in his letter and captain brenton in his history say that not much injury was received by the guerriere until about the time the mizzenmast fell which was three or four minutes after close action began lieutenant allen was put aboard the macedonian as prize master he secured the fore and main masts and rigged a jury mizzenmast converted the vessel into a bark 
Commodore Decatur discontinued his cruise to convoy his prize back to America. He reached New London December 4th. Had it not been for the necessity of convoying the Macedonian, the States would have continued her cruise, for the damage she suffered was of the most trifling character. Captain Garden stated, in Marshall's naval biography, that the States measured 1,670 tons, was manned by 509 men, suffered so from shot under the water that she had to be pumped out every watch, and that two 18-pound shot passed in a horizontal line through her main masts, all of which statements were highly creditable to the vividness of his imagination. The States measured but 1,576 tons, and by English measurement very much less, had 478 men aboard, had not been touched by a shot under water line, and her lower masts were unwounded. James states that most of her crew were British, which assertion I have already discussed, and that she had but one boy aboard, and that he was seventeen years old, in which case twenty-nine others, some of whom, as we learned from the life of Decatur, were only twelve, must have grown with truly startling rapidity during the hour and a half that the combat lasted. During the twenty years preceding 1812, there had been almost incessant warfare on the ocean, and although there had been innumerable single conflicts between French and English frigates, there had been but one case in which the French frigate, single-handed, was victorious. This was in the year 1805, when the Milan captured the Cleopatra. According to Trude, the former threw at a broadside 574 pounds actual, the latter but 334, and the former lost 35 men out of a crew of 350, the latter 58 out of 200. Or, the forces being as 100 to 58, the loss inflicted was as 100 to 60, while the state's force, compared to the Macedonian, being as 100 to 66, the loss she inflicted was as 100 to 11. British ships, moreover, had often conquered against odds as great, as, for instance, when the seahorse captured the great Turkish frigate Bader Safer, when the Astria captured the French frigate Gloire, which threw at a broadside 286 pounds of shot, while she threw but 174. And when, most glorious of all, Lord Dondonal, in the gallant little Speedy, actually captured a Spanish Zebec, the Gamo, of over five times her own force. Similarly, the corvette Camus captured the Danish frigate Frederickskorn, the brig Onyx captured the Dutch sloop Manly, the little cutter Thorn captured the French courier national, and the Paisley, the Spanish virgin, while there has been many instances of drawn battles between English twelve-pound frigates and French or Spanish eighteen-pounders. Captain Hull having resigned the command of the Constitution, she was given to Captain Bainbridge of the Constellation, who was also entrusted with the command of the Essex and Hornet. The latter ship was in the port of Boston with the Constitution, under the command of Captain Lawrence. The Essex was in the Delaware, and accordingly orders were sent to Captain Porter to rendezvous at the island of San Diego. If that failed, several other places were appointed, and if, after a certain time, he did not fall in with his commodore, he was to act at his own discretion. On October 26th the Constitution and Hornet sailed, touched at the different rendezvous, and on December 13th arrived off San Salvador, where Captain Lawrence found the Bon Citoyenne, 18. Captain Pitt barnaby green 
the bonne citoyenne was armed with eighteen thirty-two pound carronades and two long nines and her crew of one hundred fifty men was exactly equal in number to that of the hornet the latter's short weight in metal made her antagonist superior to her in about the same proportion that she herself was subsequently superior to the penguin or in other words the ships were practically equal captain lawrence now challenged captain green to single fight giving the usual pledges that the constitution should not interfere the challenge was not accepted for a variety of reasons among others the bonne citoyenne was carrying home half a million pounds in specie footnote brenton and james both deny that captain green was blockaded by the hornet and claimed that he feared the constitution james says page two seventy five that the occurrence was one which the characteristic cunning of americans turned greatly to their advantage and adds that lawrence only sent the challenge because it could not be accepted and so he would suffer no personal risk he states that the reason it was sent as well as the reason it was refused was because the constitution was going to remain in the offing and capture the british ship if she proved conqueror it is somewhat surprising that even james should have had the temerity to advance such arguments according to his own account page two seventy seven the constitution left for boston on january sixth and the hornet remained blockading the mont citoyenne till the twenty fourth when the montague seventy four arrived during these eighteen days there could have been no possible chance of the constitution or any other ship interfering and it is ridiculous to suppose that any such fear kept captain green from sailing out to attack his foe no doubt captain green's course was perfectly justifiable but it is curious that with all the assertions made by james as to the cowardice of the americans this is the only instance throughout the war in which a ship of either party declined a contest with an antagonist of equal force the cases of Commodore Rogers and Sir George Collier being evidently due simply to an overestimate of the opposing ships. End of footnote. Leaving the Hornet to blockade her, Commodore Bainbridge ran off to the southward, keeping the land in view. At 9 a.m. December 29, 1812, while the Constitution was running along the coast of Brazil, about thirty miles offshore in latitude thirteen degrees six minutes south and longitude thirty one degrees west two strange sail were made footnote official letter of commodore bainbridge january third eighteen thirteen and a footnote inshore and to windward these were h b m frigate java captain lambert forty eight days out of spithead england with the captured ship william in company directing the latter to make for san salvador the java bore down in chase of the constitution footnote official letter of lieutenant chads december thirty first eighteen twelve and a footnote the wind was blowing light from the north northeast and there was very little sea on at ten the java made the private signals english spanish and portuguese in succession none being answered meanwhile the constitution was standing up toward the java on the starboard tack a little after eleven she hoisted her private signal and then being satisfied that the strange sail was an enemy she bore and stood off toward the southeast to draw her antagonist away from the land footnote log of the constitution end of footnote which was plainly visible the java hauled up and made sail in a parallel course the constitution bearing about three points on her lee bow the java gained rapidly being much the swifter at one thirty the constitution luffed up shortened her canvas to topsails topgallant sails jib and spanker and ran easily on 
the port tack heading toward the southeast she carried her commodore's pendant at the main national ensigns at the mizzen peak and main top gallant masthead and a jack at the fore the java also had taken in the mainsail and royals and came down an alaskan course on her adversary's weather quarter footnote lieutenant chad's address to the court-martial april twenty third eighteen thirteen and a footnote hoisting her ensign at the mizzen peak a union jack at the mizzen tap gallant masthead and another lashed to the main rigging at two p m the constitution fired a shot ahead of her following it quickly by a broadside footnote commodore bainbridge's letter and a footnote and the two ships began at long bowls the english firing the lee or starboard battery while the americans replied with their port guns the cannonade was very spirited on both sides the ships suffering about equally the first broadside of the java was very destructive killing and wounding several of the constitution crew the java kept edging down and the action continued with grape and musketry in addition the swifter british ship soon forereached and kept away intending to wear across her slower antagonist's bow and rake her but the latter wore in the smoke and the two combatants ran off to the westward the englishman still a weather and steering freer than the constitution which had luffed to close footnote log of the constitution and a footnote the action went on at pistol shot distance in a few minutes however the java again forged ahead out of the weight of her adversary's fire and then kept off as before across her bows and as before the constitution avoided this by wearing both ships again coming round with their heads to the east the americans still to leeward the java kept the weather gauge tenaciously for reaching a little and whenever the constitution luffed up to close footnote log of the constitution and a footnote the former tried to rake her but her gunnery was now poor little damage being done by it most of the loss the americans suffered was early in the action by setting her foresail and mainsail the constitution got up close on the enemy's lee beam her fire being very heavy and carrying away the end of the jobber's bowsprit and her jib boom footnote lieutenant chad's letter and footnote the constitution forged ahead and repeated her former manoeuvre wearing in the smoke the java at once hove in stays but owing to the loss of headsail fell off very slowly and the american frigate poured a heavy raking broadside into her stern at about two cables length distance the java replied with her port guns as she fell off footnote lieutenant chad's letter and a footnote both vessels then bore up and ran off free with the wind on the port quarter the java being abreast and to windward of her antagonist both with their heads a little east of south the ships were less than a cable's length apart and the constitution inflicted great damage while suffering very little herself the british lost many men by the musketry of the american topmen and suffered still more from the round and grape especially on the forecastle footnote testimony of christopher speedy in minutes of the court-martial on board h m s gladiator at portsmouth april twenty third eighteen thirteen in the footnote many marked instances of valor being shown on both sides the java's masts were wounded and her rigging cut to pieces and captain lambert then ordered her to be laid aboard the enemy who was on her lee beam the helm was put aweather and the java came down for the constitution's main chains 
the boarders and marines gathered in the gangways and on the forecastle the boatswain having been ordered to cheer them up with his pipe that they might make a clean spring footnote testimony of james humble and of footnote the americans however raked the british with terrible effect cutting off their main topmast above the cap and their foremast near the cat harpings footnote log of the constitution and a footnote the stump of the java's bowsprit got caught in the constitution's mizzen rigging and before it got clear the british suffered still more finally the ships separated the java's bowsprit passing over the taffrail of the constitution the latter at once kept away to avoid being raked the ships again got nearly abreast but the constitution in her turn forereached whereupon commodore bainbridge wore past his antagonist luffed up under his quarter raked him with the starboard guns then wore and recommenced the action with his port broadside at about three ten again the vessels were abreast and the action went on as furiously as ever the wreck of the top hamper on the java lay over her starboard side so that every discharge of her gun set her on fire footnote lieutenant chad's address and a footnote and in a few minutes her able and gallant commander was mortally wounded by a ball fired by one of the american main topmen footnote surgeon j c jones's report end of footnote the command then developed on the first lieutenant chads himself painfully wounded the slaughter had been terrible yet the british fought on with stubborn resolution cheering lustily but the success was now hopeless for nothing could stand against the cool precision of the yankee fire the stump of the java's foremast was carried away by a double-headed shot the mizzenmast fell the gaff and spanker boom were shot away also the main yard and finally the ensign was cut down by a shot and all her guns absolutely silenced when at four o five the constitution thinking her adversary had struck footnote log of the constitution as given in bainbridge's letter and footnote ceased firing hauled aboard her racks and passed across her adversary's bow to windward with her topsails jib and spanker set a few minutes afterward the java's mainmast fell leaving her a sheer hulk the constitution assumed a weatherly position and spent an hour in repairing damages and securing her masts then she wore and stood toward her enemy whose flag was again flying but only for bravado for as soon as the constitution stood across her forefoot she struck at five twenty five she was taken possession of by lieutenant parker first of the constitution in one of the latter's only two remaining boats the american ship had suffered comparatively little but a few round shot had struck her hull one of which carried away the wheel one eighteen pounder went through the mizzenmast the foremast main topmast and a few other spars were slightly wounded and the running rigging and shrouds were a good deal cut but in an hour she was again in good fighting trim her loss amounted to eight seamen and one marine killed the fifth lieutenant john c alwyn and two seamen mortally commodore bainbridge and twelve seamen severely and seven seamen and two marines slightly wounded in all twelve killed and mortally wounded and twenty-two wounded severely and slightly footnote report of surgeon amos a evans End of footnote the java sustained unequalled injuries beyond the constitution says the british account footnote naval chronicle volume twenty nine page four hundred fifty two and a footnote these have already been given in detail she was a riddled and entirely dismasted hulk her loss for discussion of which see further on was forty eight killed including captain henry lambert who died soon after the close of the action and five midshipmen 
and one hundred two wounded among them lieutenant henry ducey chads lieutenant of marines david davies commander john marshall lieutenant james saunders the boatswain james humble master batty robinson and four midshipmen in this action both ships displayed equal gallantry and seamanship the java says commodore bainbridge was exceedingly well handled and bravely fought poor captain lambert was a distinguished and gallant officer and a most worthy man whose death i sincerely regret the manoeuvring on both sides was excellent captain lambert used the advantage which his ship possessed in her superior speed most skilfully always endeavouring to run across his adversary's bows and rake him when he had foreached and it was only owing to the equal skill which his antagonist displayed that he was foiled the length of the combat being due to the number of evolutions the great superiority of the americans was in their gunnery the fire of the java was both less rapid and less well directed than that of her antagonist the difference of force against her was not heavy being about as ten is to nine and was by no means enough to account for the almost five-fold greater loss she suffered the foregoing is a diagram of the battle it differs from both of the official accounts as these conflict greatly both as to time and as regards some of the evolutions i generally take the mean in cases of difference for example commodore bainbridge's report makes the fight endure but one hour and fifty-five minutes lieutenant chads two hours and twenty-five minutes i have made it two hours and ten minutes etc etc the tonnage and weight of metal of the combatants have already been stated i will give the compliments shortly the following is the comparative force and loss tons constitution one thousand five hundred seventy six java thirteen hundred forty weight of metal constitution six hundred fifty four java five hundred seventy six number of men constitution four hundred seventy five the java four twenty six loss constitution thirty four the java one hundred fifty relative force constitution one hundred java eighty nine relative loss inflicted constitution one hundred java twenty three in hardly another action of the war do the accounts of the respective forces differ so widely the official british letter makes their total of men at the beginning of the action three hundred seventy seven of whom commodore bainbridge officially reports that he paroled three hundred seventy eight the british state their loss in killed and mortally wounded at twenty four commodore bainbridge reports that the dead alone amounted to nearly sixty usually i have taken each commander's account of his own force and loss and i should do so now if it were not that the british accounts differ among themselves and whenever they relate to the americans are flatly contradicted by the affidavits of the latter's officers the british f first handicapped themselves by the statement that the surgeon of the constitution was an irishman and lately an assistant surgeon in the british navy naval chronicle volume twenty nine page four fifty two which draws from surgeon amos a evans a solemn statement in the boston gazette that he was born in maryland and was never in the british navy in his life then surgeon jones of the java in his official report after giving his own killed and mortally wounded at twenty four says that the americans lost in all about sixty and that four of their amputations perished under his own eyes whereupon surgeon evans makes the statement niles register volume six page thirty five backed up by affidavits of his brother officers that in all he had but five amputations of whom only one died and that one a month after surgeon jones had left the ship to meet the assertions of lieutenant chads that he began action with but three hundred seventy seven men 
the constitution's officers produced the java muster roll dated november seventeenth or five days after she had sailed which showed four hundred forty six persons of whom twenty had been put on board a prize the presence of this large number of supernumeraries on board is explained by the fact that the java was carrying out lieutenant general hislop the newly appointed governor of bombay and his suite together with part of the crews for the cornwallis seventy four and gun sloops chameleon and icarus she also contained stores for those two ships besides conflicting with the american reports the british statements contradict one another the official published report gives but two midshipmen as killed while one of the volumes of the naval chronicle volume twenty nine page four fifty two contains a letter from one of the java's lieutenants in which he states that there were five finally commodore bainbridge found on board the constitution after the prisoners had left a letter from lieutenant h d cornick dated january first eighteen thirteen and addressed to lieutenant peter v wood twenty second regiment foot in which he states that sixty-five of their men were killed james naval occurrences gets around this by stating that it was probably a forgery but aside from the improbability of commodore bainbridge being a forger this could not be so for nothing would have been easier than for the british lieutenant to have denied having written it which he never did on the other hand it would be very likely that in the heat of the action commodore bainbridge and the java's own officers should overestimate the latter's loss footnote for an account of shameless corruption then existing in the naval administration of great britain see lord dundonall's autobiography of a seaman the letters of the commanders were often garbled as is mentioned by brenton among numerous cases that he gives may be mentioned the cutting out of the chevrette where he distinctly says our loss was much greater than was ever acknowledged volume one page five hundred five edition of eighteen thirty seven end of footnote taking all these facts into consideration we find four hundred forty six men on board the java by her own muster list three hundred seventy eight of these were paroled by commodore bainbridge at san salvador twenty four men were acknowledged by the enemy to be killed or mortally wounded twenty were absent in a prize leaving twenty four unaccounted for who were undoubtedly slain the british loss was thus forty eight men killed and mortally wounded and one hundred two wounded severely and slightly the java was better handled and more desperately defended than the macedonian or even the guerriere and the odds against her were much smaller so she caused her opponent greater loss though her gunnery was no better than theirs lieutenant parker prize master of the java removed all the prisoners and baggage to the constitution and reported the prize to be in a very disabled state owing partly to this but more to the long distance from home and the great danger there was of a recapture commodore bainbridge destroyed her on the thirty first and then made sail for san salvador our gallant enemy reports lieutenant chads has treated us most generously and lieutenant-general hislop presented the commodore with a very handsome sword as a token of gratitude for the kindness with which he had treated the prisoners partly in consequence of his frigate's injuries but especially because of her decayed condition commodore bainbridge sailed from san salvador on january sixth eighteen thirteen reaching boston february twenty seventh after his four months cruise at san salvador he left the hornet still blockading the bon citoyen in order to see ourselves as others see us 
I shall again quote from Admiral Jurien de la Gravière, footnote, Guerres Maritimes, volume 2, page 284, Paris, 1881. End of footnote. As his opinions are certainly well worthy of attention both as to these first three battles and as to the lessons they teach when the american congress declared war on england in eighteen twelve he says it seems as if this unequal conflict would crush her navy in the act of being born instead it but fertilized the germ it is only since that epoch that the united states has taken rank among maritime powers some combats of frigates corvettes and brigs insignificant without doubt as regards material results sufficed to break the charm which protected the standard of st george and taught europe what she could have already learned from some of our combats if the louder noise of our defeats had not drowned the glory that the only invincibles on the sea are good seamen and good artillerists the english covered the ocean with their cruisers when this unknown navy composed of six frigates and a few small craft hitherto hardly numbered dared to establish its cruisers at the mouth of the channel in the very centre of the british power but already the constitution had captured the guerriere and java the united states had made a prize of the macedonian the wasp of the frolic and the hornet of the peacock the honour of the new flag was established england humiliated tried to attribute her multiplied reverses to the unusual size of the vessels which congress had had constructed in seventeen ninety nine and which did the fighting of eighteen twelve she wished to refuse them the name of frigates and call them not without some appearance of reason disguised line of battleships since then all maritime powers have copied these gigantic models as the result of the war of eighteen twelve obliged england herself to change her naval material but if they had employed instead of frigates cut down seventy fours vice it would still be difficult to explain the prodigious success of the americans in an engagement which terminated in less than half an hour the english frigate guerriere completely dismasted had fifteen men killed sixty-three wounded and more than thirty shot below the water-line she sank twelve hours after the combat the constitution on the contrary had but seven men killed and seven wounded and did not lose a mast as soon as she had replaced a few cut ropes and changed a few sails she was in condition even by the testimony of the british historian to take another guerriere the united states took an hour and a half to capture the macedonian and the same difference made itself felt in the damage suffered by the two ships the macedonian had her masts shattered two of her main deck and all her spar deck guns disabled more than a hundred shot had penetrated the hull and over a third of the crew had suffered by the hostile fire the american frigate on the contrary had to regret but five men killed and seven wounded her guns had been fired each sixty-six times to the macedonians thirty-six the combat of the constitution and the java lasted two hours and was the most bloody of these three engagements the java only struck when she had been raised like a sheer hulk she had twenty-two men killed and one hundred and two wounded this war should be studied with unceasing diligence the pride of two peoples to whom naval affairs are so generally familiar has cleared all the details and laid bare all the episodes and through the sneers which the victors should have spared merely out of care for their own glory at every step can be seen that great truth that there is only success for those who know how to prepare it 
it belongs to us to judge impartially these marine events too much exalted perhaps by a national vanity one is tempted to excuse the americans showed in the war of eighteen twelve a great deal of skill and resolution but if as they have asserted the chances had always been perfectly equal between them and their adversaries if they had only owed their triumphs to the intrepidity of hull decatur and bainbridge there would be for us but little interest in recalling the struggle we need not seek lessons in courage outside of our own history on the contrary what is to be well considered is that the ships of the united states constantly fought with chances in their favor and it is on this that the american government should found its true title to glory the americans in eighteen twelve had secured to themselves the advantage of a better organization than the english the fight between the constitution and the java illustrates best the proposition that there is only success for those who know how to prepare it here the odds in men and metal were only about ten to nine in favor of the victors and it is safe to say that they might have been reversed without vitally affecting the result in the fight lambert handled his ship as skilfully as bainbridge did his and the Java's men proved by their indomitable courage that they were excellent material. The Java's crew were new shipped for the voyage, and had been at sea but six weeks. In the Constitution's first fight, her crew had been aboard of her but five weeks, so the chances should have been nearly equal and the difference in fighting capacity that was shown by the enormous disparity in the loss and still more in the damage inflicted was due to the fact that the officers of one ship had and the officers of the other had not trained their raw crews the constitution's men were not picked but simply average american sailors as the javas were average british sailors the essential difference was in the training during the six weeks the java was at sea her men had fired but six broadsides of blank cartridges during the first five weeks the constitution cruised her crew were incessantly practised at firing with blank cartridges and also at a target footnote in looking through the logs of the constitution hornet etc we continually find such entries as beat to quarters exercised the men at the great guns exercised with musketry exercised the borders exercised the great guns blank cartridges and afterward firing at mark and a footnote the java's crew had only been exercised occasionally even in pointing the guns and when the captain of the gun was killed the effectiveness of the piece was temporarily ruined and moreover the men did not work together the constitution's crew were exercised till they worked like machines and yet with enough individuality to render it impossible to cripple a gun by killing one man the unpractised british sailors fired at random the trained americans took aim the british marines had not been taught anything approximating to skirmishing or sharpshooting the americans had the british sailors had not even been trained enough in the ordinary duties of seamen while the americans in five weeks had been rendered almost perfect the former were at a loss what to do in an emergency at all out of their own line of work they were helpless when the wreck fell over their guns when the americans would have cut it away in a jiffy as we learn from commodore morris's autobiography each yankee sailor could at need do a little carpentering or sail mending and so was more self-reliant the crew had been trained to act as if guided by one mind yet each man retained his own individuality the petty officers were better paid than in great britain and so were of a better class of men thoroughly self-respecting 
the americans soon got their subordinates in order while the british did not to sum up one ship's crew had been trained practically and thoroughly while the other crew was not much better off than the day it sailed as far as it goes this is a good test of the efficiency of the two navy the u s brig vixen twelve lieutenants george u reed had been cruising off the southern coast on november twenty second she fell in with the southampton thirty two captain sir james lucas yeo and was captured after a short but severe trial of speed both vessels were wrecked soon afterward the essex thirty two captain david porter left the delaware on october twenty eighth two days after commodore bainbridge had left boston she expected to make a very long cruise and so carried with her an unusual quantity of stores and sixty more men than ordinarily so that her muster roll contained three hundred nineteen names being deep in the water she reached san Diego after bainbridge had left nothing was met with until after the essex had crossed the equator in longitude thirty degrees west on december eleventh on the afternoon of the next day the sail was made out to windward and chased at nine in the evening it was overtaken and struck after receiving a volley of musketry which killed one man the prize proved to be the british packet nocton of ten guns and thirty-one men with fifty five thousand dollars in specie aboard the latter was taken out and the nocton sent home with lieutenant finch and a prize crew of seventeen but was recaptured by a british frigate the next appointed rendezvous was the island of fernando de norona where captain porter found a letter from commodore bainbridge informing him that the other vessels were off cape frio thither cruised porter but his compatriots had left on the twenty ninth he captured an english merchant vessel and he was still cruising when the year closed the year eighteen twelve on the ocean ended as gloriously as it had begun in four victorious fights the disparity in loss had been so great as to sink the disparity of force into insignificance our successes had been unaccompanied by any important reverse nor was it alone by victories but by the cruises that the year was noteworthy the yankee men-of-war sailed almost in sight of the british coast and right in the tract of the merchant fleets and their armed protectors our vessels had shown themselves immensely superior to their foes the reason of these striking and unexpected successes was that our navy in eighteen twelve was the exact reverse of what our navy is now in eighteen eighty two i am not alluding to the personnel which still remains excellent but whereas we now have a large number of worthless vessels standing very low down in their respective classes we then possessed a few vessels each unsurpassed by any foreign ship of her class to bring up our navy to the condition in which it stood in eighteen twelve it would not be necessary although in reality both very wise and in the end very economical to spend any more money than at present only instead of using it to patch up a hundred antiquated hulks it should be employed in building half a dozen ships on the most effective model if in eighteen twelve our ships had borne the same relation to the british ships that they do now not all the courage and the skill of our sailors would have won us a single success as it was we could only cope with the lower rates and had no vessels to oppose to the great liners but to-day there is hardly any foreign ship no matter how low its rate that is not superior to the corresponding american ones it is too much to hope that our political short-sightedness will ever enable us to have a navy that is first class in point of size but there certainly seems 
no reason why what ships we have should not be of the very best quality. The effect of a victory is twofold, moral and material. Had we been as roughly handled on water as we were on land during the first year of the war, such a succession of disasters would have had a most demoralizing effect on the nation at large. As it was, our victorious sea fights, while they did not inflict any material damage upon the colossal sea might of England, had the most important results in feelings they produced at home and even abroad. Of course they were magnified absurdly by most of our writers at the time, but they do not need to be magnified, for as they are, any American can look back upon them with the keenest national pride. For a hundred and thirty years England had had no equal on the sea, and now she suddenly found one in the untried navy of an almost unknown power. British Vessels Captured or Destroyed in 1812 The Guerriere, 49 guns, 1340 tons Macedonian, 49 guns, 1325 tons The Java, 49 guns, 1340 tons The Frolic, 19 guns, 477 tons Recaptured, The Alert, 20 guns, 323 tons Total, 167 guns, 4,330 tons, deducting the frolic. American vessels captured or destroyed. The Wasp, 18 guns, 450 tons. Nautilus, 14 guns, 185 tons. And the Vixen, 14 guns, 185 tons. Total, 46 guns, 820 tons. Vessels built in 1812. The Nonsuch Schooner, 14 guns, 148 tons, built in Charleston, cost $15,000. The Carolina Schooner, 14 guns, 230 tons, built in Charleston, cost $8,743. The Louisiana Ship, 16 guns, 341 tons, built in New Orleans, fifteen thousand five hundred dollars cost prizes made footnote these can only be approximately given the records are often incomplete or contradictory especially as regards the small craft most accounts do not give by any means the full number and a footnote prizes made the president seven prizes the united states two prizes the constitution nine prizes the congress two prizes, Chesapeake, one prize, Essex, eleven prizes, the Wasp, two prizes, the Hornet, one prize, the Argus, six prizes, small craft, five prizes, total number of prizes, forty-six. End of part six.